Hello and good morning, everyone. Um, thanks all for joining us today. Um, we've got just shy of 200 attendees today, so hopefully this will make this a, a really good session. So hopefully you can see the um, webcams up on screen there as well. So we've got four um, people who are going to be chipping in to the presentation today. It's myself. So my name is Jake. I'm from Solid Solutions. If you just give us a wave, we've got John from Solid Solutions as well. Hello, everyone. Uh, morning, John. And we've also got the two guys uh, from MECAD. We've got Rudolph and we've also got Quinton. So throughout the course of the presentation, you'll, uh, you'll hear from everyone. Okay, so obviously um, the, the four of us today who are going to be uh, chipping in. So let's introduce what we're actually going to be covering. So I'm going to hand over to the guys um, from MECAD who's going to give us a little bit more detail in terms of uh, what this challenge actually consists of. Cool. Thanks, Jake. I, I'm just going to go back in my in my seat a bit so you can you can see the the allegiance here. Um, very excited. You know the idea behind today's challenge. You know we we uh, had to replicate what is happening on the rugby field. So we thought now let's create a CAD challenge. Um, and um, if we just go through the slides now, we're going to show a few details about what is this CAD CAD's greatest challenge. Um, with the Lions tour coming, there was a lot of build up um, to, to the game. And before the game, we reached out to the guys of Solid Solutions. We said, hey, the Lions are coming here. Why don't we replicate the, the game on the field with something you know, on, on, on SolidWorks? Why don't we create a bit of a challenge? So on our blogs, we created three different challenges. And we're going to have a bit of highlights of those challenges that we've been covering over the last three weeks. So Solid Solutions put their hand up and they said they're in. And um, this is the result of, of three work three weeks of working together. Um, and, and this has been really exciting as we as we build up to to this uh, CAD CAD challenge, um, which we're gonna which we're gonna have a showdown today between MeCAD um, representing the Springboks and Solid Solutions representing the British and Irish Lions. So uh, so yeah. Following the uh, three test challenges, um, uh, we came up with the three uh, modeling, simulation, and, and kind of rendering challenges. Um, and uh, uh, the session should last a, a, a between, I don't know, uh, 45 minutes to, to an hour. It's not going to be an hour's uh, rant about refereeing or anything like that. So hopefully you should get some. Depends. Depends on how controversial your your <laughs> first uh, scrum challenge is. We'll, we'll, we'll decide off. <laughs> so so yeah. So it should be uh, some good hints and tips around uh, modeling, simulation, and um, and some rendering. Um, and Jake, yeah, if you want to go through the the, the teams. Yep. Okay. So. Um, obviously, it's myself and John representing Solid Solutions today, although we can't really take you know, credit for the amount of content you're going to see today. Uh, John's part of the marketing team, and he's... Yeah, I've done zero of the modeling, so... Yeah. <laughs> John, John has done all the marketing, though, and obviously managed to pull everyone in for us today and get all of the attendees, so that's that's great. So thanks for that, John. Um, I've actually just been pulled in at the last minute to to cover the presentation, so I really can't take very you know, hardly any credit for this whatsoever. Um, but the guys who are on the screen there, other than me and John, are the guys who've done all the work. So uh, to begin with, Adam, Josh, and Jamie, I believed, um, did a lot of the modeling for the uh, content that we've put together. Patrick's pulled the presentation together and a lot of the video that you're going to see. And then we've got Alex and Chris, who between themselves have done a lot of the simulation and uh, rendering work as well. Yeah, and we've been able to kind of cover all nationalities with that from Ireland, Scottish, Welsh. Uh, in English, so yep. yeah, the full British and British and Irish lions. Awesome, and and then from the MeCat side, representing MeCat, uh, we've got myself there in the middle, uh, Rudolf Nabar, we've got Quinton, um, he's our chief marketing officer. Uh, we've got Ivan, um, he's our local 3D experience expert, and he also did the last challenge, uh, which was the trophy. We will see more of that later. And then uh, in the left corner, we've got Wesley Sapter. Um, he was responsible for the second challenge, uh, which was the kidney. Um, he used a powerful 3D sculptor role um, inside of the 3D experience. And then lastly, uh, now Peter Aukhart did the first challenge. Uh, you, we will see the scrum machine um, that he did. 
and then lastly is Jan van Mark who did all the, the great renders for us. So uh, yeah, thanks guys. And also so much Alicia, thank you for the for the presentation you guys actually put together. This is uh, really well done. Thanks. Okay, thanks Rudolph. Uh, nice looking line up there. Okay, so all of the content. Um, yeah. Yeah, Qu Quinton briefly mentioned this um, on the intro there, but all of the content that you're going to see today has also been pushed out onto the respective blogs as well. So the Solid Solutions blog and the ME CAD blog um, have their own sort of versions of the content that you're going to see. Um, so if you want to, you know, look at that in a bit more detail on the back end of this webcast, you can obviously, yeah, you can obviously do that. Okay, so the first game, quick review, guys, 30 seconds. Obviously the. Uh, that the Lions took it on that first one, but what do we I take think, away I think from we that? Had the legs. I think we had the uh, first half was tough, but I think yeah, the full 80 minutes was uh, we came good. I think this, the uh, the the second test. I mean, I think the the, the first half in that took was it 60 minutes. So we're, we're used to playing 80 minute games. I think. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but good, good selection good selection of photo here you like you, you've taken us on our why everyone's on their on their on their butts on the ground so good 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 choice of photo we'll, we'll wait we'll wait till the second test photo uh, there's, there's also a very controversial selection by solid solution but hey we'll let that one slide well obviously the lions took it in the uh, the actual game but we've obviously got our challenge now um yeah. so we can see who's gonna who's gonna take the the crown for this particular challenge so the first yeah. one is the, the scrum challenge. So I won't spend too much time talking about this because it's all sort of explained in the videos. Um, but basically we took on the challenge of designing a scrum machine. So this is a machine that teams use to basically practice on. Uh, the idea is that they can focus purely on their, their sort of pushing technique. There's nothing else that they really have to consider. They can be single or double sided. So they can push against another set of players or you know just push against the machine itself. So we've got two two versions of the machine, and we've also got the methods in which uh, Solid Solutions and MECAD went through in order to get to the end result. So without further ado, um, let's get that playing. Hi, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Peter Hoogaard, and I work for MECAD Systems in South Africa. And today I'm going to show you a few of the features that I used while using WeldMinch to create the frame for the scrum machine that I designed for the challenge between MECAD Systems and Solid Solutions um, for the British and Irish Lions Tour of South Africa. Now, the three things that I'm going to show you very briefly is just how to use equations, adding wild beads, and how to go about thinking about how you add your groups to your Weldman structure in order to create as few features as possible so you don't have to go and create extra trims or, or add some corner treatments later on. Now, the first thing I want to show you is when we go into the sketch, you'll see that I've already added the dimensions for all of the, the other, all the global variables for all of the other dimensions. But something that's quite neat about SolidWorks is if you want to add a global variable to a dimension, you can click on that dimension, type an equal sign, give the, the variable a name, and click on this icon that you see over here and then it automatically creates that global variable and gives it that global variable the value that was already given in that dimension. Um, and now when I want to exit the sketch and force rebuild it, you can just click Control Q and it automatically does everything for you. Now the next thing I want to show you is when you can create your structure members, adding your groups in a specific way is quite important for your corner treatments. So in this first version that I'm going to show you, I'm just going to do it wrong. Um, now when I add my first group over here, I'm going to select these three segments over here. And it might look quite intuitive to, to go and select these segments that are all um, parallel with each other. But the problem that you find is when I add a new group, you'll see that I, I, I'm not actually able to go and select the, the corner treatment that I want to use because these lines that I select aren't actually attached to each other and it forces the corner treatment upon me. So if I go and add my other groups, um, these two lines and then another group over here, you'll see that in this example, this last one that I'm selecting, you can actually go and select what type of corner treatment you want because these lines have 
a common point between them. Now, if I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna go and cancel this and go and recreate it. Now, the correct way to do it, well, not the correct way to do it, but definitely a better way to do it, and the way that I always approach these type of things, is to try and go and select the the lines which have the most common points um, among them. So, in this case, I would choose this bottom four line segments over here. Add a new group. Add these three line segments over here at the top, and you'll see with each one of them, they get mitered automatically, but I can also choose how I want these end treatments, well, what I want these end treatments to be. Um, in these lines, and lastly, this one. And now you'll see that everything's pretty neat, and the cuts that you're gonna have to make to create this structure is, is not gonna be very complex, and also you're gonna be able to weld them together pretty easily and you don't have to go and add any trim or extend features um, for this weldment structure. Another thing I want to show you quickly is when you add a weld bead, there's, there's two ways you can do it. Either you can just go and select these two faces and it creates this weld bead here in the middle. Um, let's just make this radius a little bit bigger so that you can view it properly. Um, or um, alternatively, something that's that's pretty easy to use when you're going to go and add a lot of weld beads is to go and use this Smart Weld Selection tool. So when you click on that, you'll see that this pencil tool appears, um, and you can or the line tool appears, and you can draw a line through to two across two faces, and it automatically creates that weld that weld path across those two faces. And when you need to go and create a lot of weld beads, and this works pretty well because you can just go and draw a bunch of lines. Now, when that is created, you'll see that automatically my weld bead also shows over here. But what sometimes happens is, and I see this quite a lot in the internet, people ask this question, is that their weld beads don't show. And the way you show that is just to go to your weld folder over here and you can go and click on show cosmetic welds and then you'll see an illustration of what your welds will look like. The last thing I just want to show you guys quickly is the reason we use equations. Now, if you go to equations here at the top, if you don't have this over here, what you can do is just type equations here at the top and click and drag this icon onto here and you'll see, then you can easily access your equations. And anyway, if you go into your equations over here, you will be able to quickly and easily edit your entire weldment structure without having to go into your 3D sketch and editing all your dimensions. So as example, if we want to make some changes, I can go and change this angle to 20 degrees, change this to this thatch point to 250, and the width, make it 100, the height, a meter, and the length 1,800. And when you click OK, it'll automatically update all those um, dimensions and your well and structure. So you'll see in this case, I see, okay, now this, um, this th these two segments over here, they're too long, they don't attach at the right point. Um, but then I can very easily go back into equations and just say, okay, let's just change this back to 45 degrees. So yeah, that is the main reason we use equations. It's just to allow for quick and easy, easy um, editability within our weldment structures. All right, um, that is all from my side. I hope to see you guys in a future video sometime. Hello everybody, thank you guys for joining us. We're gonna take a look at how to really solve realism with regards to the lighting positioning, the scenes and the backplate. So first off, you'll see this image that we created to challenge basically solid solutions with the line series that's going on right now. Okay, so you'll see in this image, we have a source of light on the back plate. Now this sort of source of light needs to match up to the shadows that you're using, or rather the lights. I use directional lights as it costs the best shadows for me. Uh, again, this is just personal touch. You can use whatever. And then 
I used a totally random scene with more or less the same reflections as the light sources coming from the backplate. This will allow for the correct reflections and really just, again, selling the realism. This is absolutely a personal touch, so please feel free to experiment and, yeah, find what works best with you. So again, we're going to use the source of the backplate and the scenes to get the correct shadow alignment and to better position our model. So play around with the positioning, play around with the lights and the scenes. Eventually, you'll come across something and you'll learn from it. Great way to learn is by experimenting. Thank you guys, and I'll see you in the next video. Hi. Challenge number one was the scrum machine. And the first thing we had to consider was what modeling approach to take. As you can see from this animation, there are a number of parts built around a core framework. To make everything easy to line up and edit in future, we decided a master modeling approach would work best. Master modeling is a practice where you create multiple parts within a single part file and then use insert into new parts or save bodies to later save them into their own part files for use in assemblies or drawings. It's really handy when designing integrated parts and this is why we chose to create the top and bottom sections of the scrum machine's frame in this way. When it comes to save your bodies out, you can find the save bodies command in the insert features menu, but for this part we chose to save out the bodies into two different parts by control selecting the bodies in the feature tree, right clicking and choosing insert into new part. This then created brand new parts that link back to the original and they'll update whenever the original does. The main basis for our model structure was a 3D sketch. And to create this sketch, we actually made a simple 3D part and then converted the relevant edges to use as paths for our weldments. This is a technique which can sometimes make a sketch easier to create, and by using this approach along with master modeling, it gives us a really flexible, easy to edit assembly. Let's take a quick look. If I tile the original frame master part, the top and bottom saved out halves, and the final assembly, and then make a change to the original, we should see it update throughout. To make changes to the overall dimensions, I just need to edit the original extrude and fill it features dimensions and then rebuild. As I then click into each of the other files to make them active, they rebuild too. And we can see how they change. You can see everything updates, including the spacing on items such as the pads. And I hope that shows how with the right setup and forward planning, you can make design changes really simple for yourself and your models. The other modeling tip I want to share for the scrum machine is how we create the more organic corners found on the pads by using multi-radius fillets paired with setback parameters. Inside the normal fillet command, I can pick one of the edges and use the context toolbar to quickly select the rest. Then ticking multi-radius fillet allows me to edit the size of fillets on the edges I want to. Then I just need to tweak the setback fillet parameters to give me the blend I'm after. This method can create transitions where edges meet, which don't look great, so to improve the aesthetics and smoothness of this corner, we then use the delete face command with the tangent fill option to form a single smooth face. If you want to see a few extra tips on how we created the scrum machine, such as creating a custom weldment profile, then check out our blog on our website. But next up, I want to share a few tips we used while setting up a simulation on our design. So after creating the model, we wanted to run an initial static simulation to ensure that the frame will withstand forces applied by even some of the world's best players and find out how the design performs with and without a cross brace. You can check out our full sets of tips and results on our blog, but here I'm just going to highlight a couple of the features and techniques that saved us time and effort during our setup. First, when beginning the study, we made sure to use automatically convert toolbox parts to connectors. Connectors in simulation don't need to be physically modeled, you just need to specify the connecting faces, and once you've got a connector set up, it's really easy to edit parameters such as torque values and strength data, and also switch the connector between a range of materials. Using connectors also helps your simulations to run faster and saves you having to set up contact sets. So using that tick box automatically converted all of the fixtures we inserted from the SOLIDWORKS toolbox and saved us a lot of time. But for the custom made pin connectors at the top, we had to separately remove them from the study and manually add in a pin connector from the simulation library. This is still very worthwhile when it comes to saving time and your simulation.
You've probably noticed that we're only looking at half of the model here in the simulation study. That's because the model is symmetrical and we're assuming symmetrical forces are going to be applied to it. So we can use the SOLIDWORKS symmetry fixtures and this allows us to use just half the model but get the results for the full thing. This also helps to stabilize the model and it majorly decreases the runtime of your simulation as you're literally cutting the mesh in half. Because there are some large flat plates on this model, we want to ensure shell elements are used for these. Using this type of element will help our study to run smoothly as possible. As we've used sheet metal features to create these plates in SOLIDWORKS, they'll automatically be converted through to shells. Though if there are any other flat plates or anything else that's appropriate, we could specify them as, as shells manually. Shells massively reduce the computation time by reducing the number of elements in the study, and it should aid convergence. Another benefit of shells is they allow you to quickly change the thickness of the plates directly from within the simulation. In case, for example, you wanted to test a few different options of thicknesses and optimize your designs. You can even run an optimization study to do this for you. For each of the challenges, we also work to produce a number of animations with SOLIDWORKS Visualize. And we'd like to reveal a few of the techniques we use to bring our renders to the next level. For the scrum machine assembly animation, we wanted the parts to appear like they'd been laid out on the floor in a natural fashion before flying up and forming the full assembled scrum machine. When manually positioning parts though, it's quite time consuming to make them appear not overly perfect. Luckily, Visualize has a physics engine. Physics in Visualize essentially allows us to add contacts between parts and then drop them so that they come to rest in a realistic place. To position the parts of the scrum machine, we used the following process. First, we pulled the parts out slightly and gave them different angles so that they fell on different sides. Then we gave them a dynamic simulation type and the collider geometry mesh so that the simulation would use their actual shape rather than just a general bounding box to calculate how they fell. Then we just had to open the simulation manager, press record to allow the parts to fall to the ground. The shake button could then be used if we didn't like where they fell. This is a bit like an earthquake. It just shakes all the parts up and down and helps them fall into different positions. So you can just press that until you're happy with the result. Once all the parts were laid out on the floor in a way we were happy with, we just needed to remove the physics animation as we didn't need to actually show the parts dropping. From this point, we needed to use the keyframe animation to take the animation from the floor back to its original position just by changing its properties back, making a couple of small tweaks on the way, such as showing the pad smoothly sliding in. And with that, our animation was done. We wanted to place our scrum machine and kicking tee models within a stadium for a few renders. However, this wasn't available as a default environment within Visualize. For a static render, we could have potentially just used a 2D image as a backplate, but we wanted a 3D environment so that we could display our model from a number of angles. To do this, we needed a HDR, a high dynamic range image. There are plenty of sites that you can download HDRs from. One of them is Polyhaven, which gives you access to some great free HDR images. HDR images and Visualize provide lighting detail as well as a background, and they can be worth using just for that. Though, if you are showing the environment in the background, be aware that you might need a 4K resolution. If you go above this, then it can result in some huge files that can be slow and sluggish to work with. The Stadium HDR we downloaded is a great start, but we wanted to modify it so it's specifically made for the Lions Tour. To do this, we can use an image manipulation software to add some logos and rugby posts into the environment. We used Photoshop to do it, and a key tip if you are using Photoshop is to make sure you're working in 32-bit mode, otherwise you won't be able to save it out as a HDR at the end. When you're done making edits, it's best to save the file as a copy in the environments folder inside your Visualize content folder. This will make it nice and easy to apply your environment from within Visualize with just a simple drag and drop. Once inserted, the flatten floor option is often useful as that pulls the bottom of the spherical environment up to make a dome, providing a flat surface for the floor that the scrum machine can rest on and making the grass actually feel like ground. Okay, so there we have it. Test one. Um, some great content in there, I'm sure you'll all agree. Uh, quite different approaches as well. Um, I think the, the method that we took at Solid Solutions was very much more a, a hints and tips uh, style for that whereas MECAD obviously took us step by step through some of the modeling processes. Uh, so something to take away for, for everyone, I think. So what we'll do is we'll open up the polls. So if you jump across we to, 
to your, your dialog for go to. Now I'm going to open up a poll and you should see an area there. I'm just going to launch that now and you've got the ability to uh, basically tick on which one you think was best out of those two videos. Now what we haven't checked yet is what the split is of attendees. Uh, that might be more of a representation uh, than the actual quality of the um, presentation. He's got the. Uh, or, or you, or you could just be chair. like com completely unbiased in your in your voting. Everybody, just you know, com use your use your your in, your impressions and not your not your hard guys. Yeah, yeah. Not like the. Uh, <laughs> put, put, the your, put your, put your, put your nationalities to one side. <laughs> put your jersey aside for a day. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so we've had it open for about sort of 40, 50 seconds there. Um, so we've got about 63%, 64% in favor of solid solutions for that one. So I'm sorry, oh. guys, but it looks, like <laughs> well it, looks, it looks like it's matching the result of the first test. Um, well done. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Uh, I'm I'm going to be honest and say that uh, after you guys did that first challenge, uh, I I took Rudolph's team by the collar and I said no, we we do need to up the game. So I I, I did I did put a bit of a Rusty Erasmus. I, I took out the the good old YouTube and we did we did a bit of a review. Um, so I, I definitely think we're going to have a better a better go of the second one. So just keep keep your eyes peeled. Yeah. Okay. So I'll just I'll just share that briefly just so you can uh, all see the exact results. So there we go. Sixty-four to thirty-six. Uh, in well waiver for that one. Uh, okay, so let's jump back into the PowerPoint again. Okay, guys, so test two, review, anything to add for that, or should we just jump straight into the uh, the second challenge? Uh, I definitely think, uh, John, those, <laughs> those, two, those two boys are, are the guys that broke your, your Scrum machine, so I, I definitely think you didn't need gravity and visualize. I just think yeah. you needed a sprint up front row and would have broken it for you. Yeah, I think what is it? Bafta Clerk did a, a mastery in wind up merchant uh, display, which yeah, often a player that you everyone hates, but you you kind of love if he's in your team. Uh, yeah. yeah, bring on the second challenge. <laughs> Over to you, Rudolf. So the, the second challenge was the kicking tee. Um, so obviously the kicking tee is a vital piece uh, to the game, utilized on, on game day itself and on the practice field. Um, if you're Andre Pollard or Dan Bigger, uh, you will have your preference when it comes to the kicking tee. Uh, with so many different designs and shape, this was actually a really, really great challenge and the possibilities were endless. Uh, MeCat Systems went for the standard type PGT, uh, but we utilized a 3D sculptor or within 3D experience uh, for the more complex geometry. Uh, Solid Solutions, on the other hand, went for the two-piece kicking tee. Um, it's an adjustable kicking tee that retains its strength and stability when the ball is kicked. So let's jump into that video and see what, we, uh, what we've done. My name is Wesley Septo and today I will be showing you how MeCat Systems created their version of the Kicking Tee within the 3D Experience platform making use of the X-Shape app. The X-Shape app makes use of subdivisional modeling where the push and pull technique is being utilized. So after declaring the number of facets and zones, we will be creating the desired shape, which is our Kicking Tee. So after declaring it, we select our filtering to be faces as well as the symmetry setting so that whatever is done on the one side is automatically transferred over to the other side as well. Selecting your faces and pushing and pulling in the desired direction to obtain the desired result for the kicking tee. So I'm just speeding up the process to make it easier for explanation. Then I can also do a draft analysis to obtain the desired result as well. One of the challenges I faced was how do I add the base for this kicking tee? So I've got the top layer of it, so I just need the supporting base. And what better tool to use than SolidWorks? So, by simple drag and drop from the 3D Experience platform into SolidWorks, I can now, or I am now, able to add the necessary features to obtain the desired result to make our kicking tee one that is ready for game time.
As you can see, the integration between the 3D Experience platform and SOLIDWORKS can be a seamless transition. I've added the base to the kicking tee and now we are able to generate our first conceptual design and send for manufacturing for 3D printing. And as you can see, I've also added a little bit of national flair so that our boys on the field can represent our country all across the world wherever they take this kicking tee. After I have finished my design, I will now save it from SOLIDWORKS desktop into my collaborative space within the 3D Experience platform and then I can always just add a revision comment which is ready for 3D printing and then I can also just set what settings I would like to add or remove for the saving it to the 3D Experience platform. All right. And right after the saving process, you will now also notice the status of it, as well as the revision number, as well as its maturity state. Much similar to PDM, but in this case, it is the 3D Experience platform. From SOLIDWORKS, I can now open up or show a preview of my kicking tee within the platform, showing the X-shape detail as well as the SOLIDWORKS detail. And now I can now add a comment for my kicking tee. And in this case, I can say that this is the rugby challenge number two. Hi, everybody. Thank you guys for joining me. We're going to take a look at the T challenge between MECAD and Solid Solutions. Now, this is part of a series of challenges. I recommend going back and watching those videos. Specifically, we're going to take a look at the detailing process of this T. As it is one part, you'll see it's very difficult to basically start adding appearances where you want the detail to come out. For example, on our beautiful flag over here. Now, we want to make sure that these appearances are basically on its own and not linked to the base appearance. The way we're going to do that is we're going to go to Tools, Split Part, and just start selecting our faces, making sure that we select all of it, that you actually want to bring detail out, and say Execute Split. Now, we can start adding our appearances and you'll see that it changes completely uh, separate from the base material okay. and then obviously you can start playing around with it with regards to different configurations getting a lot more output thank you guys for watching this has been Vian and I'll see you guys in the next video so challenge two the kicking tee much like the scrum machine, we decided to go for a master modeling approach as it's made up of two integrated parts that we'll need to change together. And although the design is relatively simple here, we've still got a few good tips to share that we used in our modeling process. First off, we used a common but effective workflow for plastic parts to create the base of the model, using shell to hollow it out and adding support back into the shape with some ribs. These ribs could have been created with an extrude boss feature, but the rib feature is actually typically faster and it will give you more flexibility when it comes to adding draft. To create these ribs, we only have to draw a single line, set the thickness, and then it will automatically extrude up to the nearest walls. To round off the top of the rib, we used a fillet, specifically a full round fillet, which creates a smooth blend without us having to input any radius value. These are great if you think the thickness of your ribs might change as the fillet radius will automatically update with it to keep the top round. A little time saving tip when using full round fillets or a number of other commands is to keep an eye on your cursor and make use of right click shortcuts. Here this advances to the next selection box when I right click and the final right click actually confirms the command. It's nothing major but it cuts down on how much you need to move your mouse around. On the top of the T, some of the studs were rounded with the dome command. Now, the dome command isn't that commonly used, so you might not know where to find it. My top tip in this situation is to use the command search. Simply tap W and you'll begin searching for commands. So here, if I hit W and type dome, it will find the command for me. 
I can then press to use the command or click the I to see where to find the command for next time. If it's a command you want to use a lot, you can even drag it onto your command manager. Change your mind and you can remove it just by holding Alt and dragging it off. Anyway, the dome command itself allows you to add or remove material to round a surface. This is really a simple example of using it, but it can also be a great time saver if you're using it on a face that isn't circular, such as when we used it to add the small dimple into this razor design. You can also quickly get some interesting results if you choose a non-continuous dome on a face with multiple edges, such as this octagon here, which really reminds me of some European architecture. But I'm getting distracted. Back to the kicking tee. The key element of this design is that the two halves are threaded to allow the height of the tee to be adjusted. To create these threads, we needed a custom thread profile to use in the thread command. We sketched this out in a new file and saved it as a SOLIDWORKS library feature part into our custom thread location. You can check this location in your file options if you need. Back in the master part, the thread command was then used on both bodies, along with revolved bosses and cuts to neatly round the ends of the threads. To show the range of motion of the T in the assembly, we used a couple of advanced mates. If you haven't used advanced mates before, it's worth exploring them to see what is possible. Here we used an advanced mechanical mate, the screw mate, so that spinning the model would cause it to rise, and a limit mate so that the T could only move up and down a set distance. Adding related models to your scenes is often a great way to add realism to your renders. The winning entry from our latest visualized contest submitted by Rack Systems demonstrates this perfectly, as the additional models really help to give a feel of how the TV rack could be used. In the case of our kicking tee, we wanted a more realistic grass to use, as the HDR image's floor wasn't quite good enough for a close-up. This is where downloading models can come in useful, and Visualize can import models from a huge number of programs, not just SOLIDWORKS. This includes more artistically focused programs which can create some very organic shapes. GrabCAD is one of the most popular free sources of 3D models, but be sure to check out some of the paid model sites for even more advanced models and choice. For our render, we downloaded this tileable grass model and imported it using the FBX importer. All of the appearances will import as well, so we just needed to move everything into position. The appearance did come in looking somewhat generic, so to make it look a bit more like the colour of the stadium grass, we just modified the blended colour. Okay, so challenge two uh, out of the way. So. I think this one potentially might be a little bit, a little bit tighter. Um, I think the two renders that you can see up on screen there, you know, the Solid Solutions one at the top and the ME CAD one at the bottom. I don't think there's a great deal in it. We've obviously got the background and the grass for the Solid Solutions one, but I do think some of the detail in the ME CAD one, especially the sort of leather texture, really do jump out. So uh, we'll open the the polyp again, and. Um, Come on, Jake. You, you've got to, you've got to admit that our, our kicking tee does look a little bit prettier than yours. It's it's a nice looking kicking tee, yeah, and, uh, and the detail in the render there is is very nice. But it, it's not down to me; it's down to the the people. So let's see what they're what they're saying. While while you guys are, are voting, thank you to those of you who are um are on Instagram. I'm uh, um, oh, sorry, on LinkedIn with your pictures. It's looking great. Nice to see you guys watching the webinar uh, from wherever yeah, you are. Great. It's really, really cool to see. So great keep keep the photos coming in. It's really, really great. Well, it's looking like, similar to the, the actual rugby, people are looking to get their money's worth because this one is very much going in ME CAD's direction. So it's oh, going yes. to be it's going to be down to the final <laughs> test. Um, Here we go. Uh, now, now we're getting to the it's serious almost, part. It's almost an exact same split as it was on the first poll. So we're about 66% in ME CAD's favour. And Is it uh, the organic uh, modelling in the... Uh, I think it must be. I think... Design that, uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's an interesting thing to, to note there. I mean, there's probably quite a few people on the call here who haven't really 
seen any of the 3D um, connection stuff before and the um, the, the X design and X shape uh, apps. So they are they're really nice tools. So if obviously if you're interested in those, make sure you um, get in touch with the guys there to have a look at those. But yeah, I think I'll close that response now and I'll just publish the results so you can all see them. So yeah, 66% uh, for ME card and 34% uh, for solid solutions there. Looking good, looking good. Into the, the final challenge. That's it, right. So let's uh, jump back on again to the PowerPoint. I feel, oh. I feel like these matchups we're having are, are, are quite friendly competitiveness. I, I suspect tomorrow's match is... It, it will be uh, slightly less friendly. <laughs> and so I, I, I was surprised that you used some of these pictures. I, I personally would have used the, the picture of Alan Wynne Jones at, at the end of, of the test last week, you know, beaten and bruised, you know, <laughs> desperate for another chance, desperate for another chance. I, I cannot wait for tomorrow. It's going to be an absolute humdinger. Uh, Quentin, you, you said you need to decide between your, your son's birthday and the, the rugby match. Yeah, yeah. This yeah. is birthday party is on Saturday, so I'm gonna have to make a toss up between birthday party and uh, and rugby. So. I'm sure you can. You sure you can have Daddy a screen, a screen, screen visible somewhere. somewhere. Yeah. yeah, watch watch on the phone. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so the the final challenge then, uh, as the image suggested, there uh, was looking at the trophy. So really, quite a nice. Um, looking trophy this year. Um, yeah. So what the guys have done on the two respective uh, companies have basically gone down the route of modeling the trophy and creating some tips and tricks and workflows along the way um, that hopefully will be useful for all, uh, for everyone who's out there listening. So if we jump into that final video and then we'll have the one last poll at the end to decide who's gonna take the crown. So I'm gonna show you a bit about using 3D experience to create the trophy. Um, and you'll see it, there's a few reasons why we're doing this. We're starting off just adding some reference geometry and so forth. And then from there, we're going to pull in a globe, which is a shape, just a, a parametric blob. We can use a shape, which is one of the, the uh, features in 3D experience that you don't find traditionally in CAD software. So this is a push-pull modeler and creates, um, it's a sub-D modeler, so we can create these uh, surfaces that we pull into CAD and use for various CAD purposes. And we're happy with the shape. It sort of matches the cup up uh, or the top portion of the trophy. Um, and now we're just gonna spend some time cutting this. Now, obviously a lot of the things in the trophy you can do via, um, you know, revolves and so forth. And I do actually use revolves in this, but using these as the basis for your shapes makes a huge difference in how easy they are to change in the end. So just here, got to switch it to intersect and, and then use the plane as the cutting surface. Um, you'll notice a lot of these tools are also very similar to SolidWorks. The icons are similar. Now we're just switching over to the cloud parametric modeler um, so that we modify this design for further. So delete that top portion make sure everything looks clean and delete the face, we get a surface that we can work with. Now we could do a sketch and do convert entities, but that's not really the best way. So we're gonna to go to surfaces and do intersection. Um, this is gonna give, give us a curve to sweep along to create those sort of um, swept or bent pieces at the top of the trophy. Um, so you'll see we we have one curve there, and we're going to use this as the basis for a plane and then a uh, profile to sweep along. And you'll see all of this is, you know, quite familiar, so you're not going to be alienated using a CAD tool like this. And this can still pull in SOLIDWORKS models. You can pull in models from here into SOLIDWORKS, which I'll show you shortly. And so it's not like you're importing and exporting designs they stay linked together. So changes in one will reflect the other. And I'm actually going to show you that near the end. It's just updating some of the dimensions. Going to select sweep. And uh, 
select the sweep path and the profile. And there we go, the start of our cut. Now, obviously, we want to pattern this. I'm just going to change some of the dimensions. It doesn't look quite right compared to the uh, actual model. So go to circular patterns and select bodies. Select the body we want to pattern. There's some rotation needed there. So, um, again, most of the CAD tools you're familiar with will be on here. Your um, extrudes, cut, surface tools, sweeps, fillets, all of that. Um, there's even some additional tools that allow you to generate designs based on load cases. Um, now, traditionally, topology analysis does the reverse. You have a load case and you start removing items. Um, in this case, we can actually add items. You define a volume and it designs something for you. And using things like sub volume, you can actually get a, a nice little surface. So what I want to show you now is if I modify the design on the sub -D, it updates the CAD side as well. So there's no way you could have updated your spline that easily. Well, let's take this over. I've done and finalized a lot of the design. And I want to pull this into solid so first, I'm just quickly creating a part in SolidWorks. I'm going to add it in there. I'm going to search for the item. And this is one way of getting it. There's an interface in SolidWorks also to pull this in. Um, so you're not limited to just one way. And just a drag and drop, and it loads in SolidWorks. Now, let's modify something on the sub D side and see how that pulls through to the SOLIDWORKS side. So I've used a sub D surface to define uh, the shape of that sweep. You can see there, I'm just gonna, let's make it really fat in the middle. Let's pull it out, it looks good. And we just save this, pull it over to SOLIDWORKS again. So just uh, indicates, listen, this is not the latest version, the cloud version is the latest. You just right click, reload from server, and you'll see the model update on the SOLIDWORKS side. Just a quick load. And there we go. So you have full you know, interoperability between these two CAD pieces. And then from here, you can do all sorts of things, uh, splines on surfaces and so forth. So uh, I hope this has been useful in showing you how you can use 3D experience to finalize your designs and create better designs than you might normally be able to with uh, just parametric modeling. Hello, everybody. Thank you guys for joining me as we're going to take a look at the part three, which is the trophy challenge that we did with Solid Solutions. Now, I'm not specifically going to talk about the trophy itself. I'm going to talk talk about these logos that are put in. Now these logos are looking pretty cool and the technique I used for it is actually very very easy. So I just went ahead and looked for a Springbok photo or a logo on Google, downloaded that and I simply created a PNG file which is a decal file. Now after that, I created a DXF of it. A very, very easy tool you can use is Convertio, uh, which is a free tool, and it does an excellent job, as you can see. I then pulled that DXF into SolidWorks, created the full solid feature, and brought the model into Visualize. Now, the reason I did that as a solid model is because I can actually go behind the solid model and start adding lighting effects. So these lighting effects are only at the back obviously and I added a different color light for obviously both of these different logos of ours. Really proud showing both logos as we continue our rugby series. Now we will see what big difference it makes. This is a very nice clean photo but if you switch to the uh, precision or the accurate mode, you'll see all the lighting takes effect.
Now this is a very, very cool way to get the different animations and really play around with what you can do. You'll see that I do have one already done and the lighting effect is specifically what I used. Zoom out and have a light changing. So you'll see, you don't have to keep it on all the time. It does make for great, great videos, as you can see. Thank you guys for watching. I hope this helped and have a nice day. The Lion's Trophy, the final challenge and arguably the most complex, at least in terms of geometry. While looking to model this was initially daunting, on closer inspection it became clear that the model was a combination of relatively straightforward shapes. We've written a modeling walkthrough up on our blog, but here we'll show you the two most complicated parts in a little more detail and how to model them in SolidWorks. The logos on the top of the trophy have a slightly unusual profile and they're curved to fit onto the trophy. To save time, I've got a few sketches ready, the 2D outlines of the logos and a sketch to trim the gap into them. I've also displayed a sketch that was used earlier to create one of the strands and we're going to use that to create a surface revolve. Once we've got the surface revolve, we can use the wrap feature to curve the 2D logo sketch onto the revolved surface. The scribe option is the only one available when wrapping onto a surface and that doesn't change any geometry, it just splits the faces that you're wrapping onto. This does allow us to use delete face though to remove the area of the surface that we don't need and then we can just use trim surface to add the gap into the logo pieces. To finish, we need to thicken each surface individually to turn them into solid bodies. As you can only do one surface at a time, that means repeating the command a lot, and when you are repeating a command several times in a row like this, a really good shortcut to know is the enter key. Confirm the command by pressing enter, and then press enter again, and it'll launch you straight back into the command, which makes this a lot quicker. Next I want to show you how to model the outer casing of the trophy, the sheath. If you consider the sheath by itself, it's essentially an upside down tripod with curved edges and faces. Again, thankfully it's surprisingly simple thanks to the fact that we can create the bulk of it with a surface revolve. And I've prepared two sketches here to speed things up. To be efficient with how I go about creating this, I'll revolve 120 degrees around a midplane to create one third of the shape, which I'll then later detail and circular pattern to finish. After creating the surface, I'll use the 2D sketch to trim it down to size. Next, I need to thicken it to turn it into a solid, making sure not to merge it into the main body. By keeping it separate, we can then pattern it and then combine it together afterwards to form the complete sheath. To round up our modeling tips, I want to quickly elaborate on a couple of the features you may have noticed me using in the earlier footage. First up, in the trophy model, we made extensive use of the freeze bar. This is the orange bar that you can see in the feature tree and it's very helpful when you're working on complex parts. You can drag it from the top down past any features you want to freeze. These features are then locked, which means you can't edit them, but they also don't need to rebuild when you make model changes. This really cuts down your rebuild time and helps you model with less waiting around. To enable the freeze bar, go into your system options and hit this tick box. If you can't remember where to find it, just search freeze in the options and it'll take you there. Two other options I was using to save time are mouse gestures and the spin box. Mouse gestures appear when you hold right click and drag your mouse and they're a great way to save time when selecting commands. Here you can see me selecting center line and line from mouse gestures. Though the mouse gestures are completely customizable so you could even map something like the escape command to a direction, allowing you to quickly exit commands with just the mouse. The spin box is essentially the option to change a dimension's value by scrolling your mouse wheel up and down. It works for most dimensions and features, and the default increment for this is 10 millimeters, but my preference is to change that down to one millimeter. What most people don't know about this though, is you can actually hold down control to increment 10 times more, so 10 millimeters at a time, or hold down alt to scroll 10 times less, so 0.1 millimeter at a time, in my case at least. It's very much an optional shortcut to know about, but, but it's one that can save you quite a bit of time and I certainly find myself using it quite regularly. 
For our final visualize tip, I want to talk briefly about bump maps. Bump maps are flat, typically black and white images that you map to an object and they help provide the illusion of depth in a surface. But depending on the brightness of the area of the bump map, it will cause parts of the surface to appear like they're sticking out or dipping in. An example I've always found very helpful is from Wikipedia. They show how that adding a dotted bump map image to this orange sphere can make it look like an actual orange just by giving it that texture. And I hope the bump map that we're going to show for this rugby ball is another great example for you too. Some bump maps come with Visualize and you can find many more to download online and you can even make your own with tools like Adobe Illustrator or Photoshop. You can make use of bump maps in SOLIDWORKS too and since 2019 you can even translate them into mesh geometry which you can send straight to a 3D printer. It's pretty cool. Decals are images that can be added onto the model to give it more context and realism. Commonly, they're used to apply logos or stickers to a product. Initially, they'll always appear as flat artwork with no reflections or texture to them, but you can add an appearance of the decal to solve that. On this rugby ball, we want the same rugby ball texture to come through onto the logo decal. So we can do that by duplicating the white appearance and adding it to the decal. As the decal is smaller than the rugby ball as a whole, we'll need to change the tiling parameters though so it all lines up. Decals also have other uses and you can use them to add things like realistic marks or grunge to a model. This ball for example needs some mud on it. These kind of images can be downloaded from many sites such as Shutterstock or Adobe Stock as well as more CAD based sites such as Polygon. Once the mud decal is added, we can adjust the colour and position and duplicate it into different areas of the model. When it came to adding the logo onto the trophy in Visualize, we tried both decals and bump maps. And you can see in this back example that's done with the decal, it doesn't really appear like the logo's been etched in. It's too flat. To make it seem realistic, we needed to etch the logo with a bump map. And as this is applied as an appearance, we have the added benefit of just being able to toggle it on or off and remove the Lions logo at a click of a button. I hope you found all these tips useful and are feeling inspired to add another level of realism to your renders. Now I'll pass you back to Jake. So that brings us to the, uh, the end of the challenges. So thanks for the, the two guys there presenting on those videos. Again, some really useful um, hints and tips in both of those sessions. So lastly, we will open up the final poll. Um, so this is obviously looking at that last group of content that we just watched. So uh, whose trophy do you think deserves to win? It's sort of important to note that it is pretty much the same trophy. It's just the workflow that we went through um, to get to the end result. So if you jump across to your dialog box now, you should see you've got access to the poll and we'll see who comes out on top. This is going to be a close one. Yeah, yeah. very, very, very close sort of at the moment. Yeah. Intense countdown music or something in the background. <laughs> yeah. I think you can but, see the live <laughs> updates, can't you, Jake? Yeah, I've got the live update. 78% of people have voted. So if you've not yet oh. voted, it's very, very tight in there. So make sure you get your vote in. Everyone counts. Um, and if, if I'd have pre-prepared this a little better, I might have had it so I could have spun round and done you a little drum roll on the kit that you can see in the background there. But <laughs> well, there we need a drum roll. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't think ahead. <laughs> okay, 81% oh, of people have voted. Where will the bragging rights go? Yeah, I'll, I'll just leave it for, uh, for 10 more seconds for anyone else who wants to get their vote in. Okay, I think we'll close it there. 80, 81, 82% of people have voted. So I will close the poll. Drum roll, please. Let's share the results. So the win. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. It's well done, guys. It's I'm, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, not sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well it's done, guys. Good. Well done. <laughs> yeah, but no, I assure thinking... you, tomorrow, tomorrow's game won't be as close. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, let's see. I think... Um, some great tips there. I think it's it's been yeah. uh, a bit of fun with the with the polls and stuff. But yeah, hopefully there's some really good tips there for everyone. 
Yeah, thank thank you guys. Uh, I I must be honest. The uh, the level the level of of uh, the quality of the tips and and the, the level of the challenge was was super high. And thank you, uh, Jake and John and the team and Patrick. Well done. You guys did an incredible job. And thank you for taking up uh, up on the challenge and uh, and for your contribution. And uh, yeah, thank you guys. That was a lot of fun. Um, I don't know if there's any questions that people have. Maybe we can. Uh, answer a few questions in the chat or in the polls if there's anything. But uh, thank you for the photos, um, Paul and Larry and guys like that that are posting pictures. Really cool to see you guys posting pictures. Yeah, um, we, we're ones. gonna be, yeah, we're gonna be contacting you guys um, later on this afternoon for the for the lucky winners, and we'll post you your your jerseys. Enjoy the enjoy the game. I, I didn't say good luck for tomorrow. I said enjoy the game tomorrow, guys. Yeah, right. yeah, likewise. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't think there's any, I don't think there's any look needed. Is that right, John? No, no. I, I think I think we've got this. It, depending on what Warren Gatland does, I think, I, I've got a feeling it's going to be. It's yeah, Wales will be the <laughs> majority of the team. But yeah, we'll see. I think the machine, the ToJ, will uh, will will bring it home for us. I think. <laughs> Super. Thanks, everyone. Goodbye. Right. Cheers, guys. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone.